So I, I guess, you know, um, I'm one of the few academics here in the room, and, well, in the whole conference. So I want to give a, it's kind of a background of why I'm here and kind of a background of the work and stuff like that first, okay? Um, so we've been working kind of with a lot of industry partners in the last, I would say, two years, kind of trying to build large, large language model applications, okay? And, but primarily we've been working with a lot of the big companies. So it'd be like, think like, you know, Google, Huawei, you know, Meta, talking with experts there and kind of trying to understand their problems. And two things we kind of realize is, you could almost think right now, I would say we're like on the punch card era of developing these type of applications, okay? So here we're not talking about developing the large language model itself, but we're talking about developing the kind of applications that actually use large language models, okay? So, you know, we went from like punch card to like VI, Emacs, you know, uh, Eclipse, kind of GitHub. So, you know, grown-ups don't develop software with X editors or prompt, you know, playgrounds. So the question is, you know, how can our industry move from this kind of very ad hoc -y kind of process to actually really engineering and developing software repeatable, okay? So that's one thing that we learned, okay? The second thing that we learned is um, over time, we discovered that these applications are amazing to get a very quick Twitter demo, okay? So it's very quick to get a demo, and then the leadership expects that while well, you got the demo in like in a week, that we could ship in like three weeks. But actually that thing from a demo to shipping is extremely much harder in these type of applications. So that's kind of the background of this. And then as we started discovering, like this, talking to this, and now talking to other people in the industry, we discovered, okay, first is probably not a good idea to talk to the meta and the, the meta folks and the Google guys, because they have a lot of experts to help them. Instead, actually, we need to talk for a lot of people in the industry, because a lot of times you think you have a problem and you think you're the only person who has a problem, but actually it's very important for us to kind of bubble up these problems highlight them, actually even give them names so we can work on them as a field altogether on it, right? Whether it's academia or industry, okay? So that's kind of the background of there. And then there's a lot of people on this because we don't only, so we went in and we basically defined 10 challenges that we thought were very important. Actually, since we wrote the paper, we discover there's a lot more challenges actually in the shipping part. So that's, we're gonna be having another piece of work that talks about that. But in addition to that, we actually build a full platform. You can think of it as like GitHub 2.0 for foundational model apps, okay? And another thing is I, I always use the word foundational model. I don't use the words large language model because at this stage we can all agree it's not about languages, okay? So there's multimodal and it's not about large. There are small models too, okay? So that's why I use foundational models. I don't wanna update my slides every couple of weeks, okay? So can I give you an idea of kind of when I talk, we, so we use this idea of AIware. So you can think of there's like codeware and AIware. So if you think of the wiper, you know, the, the software that actually operates the wipers, you know, the automated wipers on your windshield, okay, the classical way of developing that software is, you know, you have optical sensors, acoustic sensors, there's ton, tons of source code, and then you have a developer writing code. On the other side, this was AIware, you basically have a camera on the windshield that's taking pictures, 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 and that camera has a, 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 a model, an AI model, machine learning model, that has actually hundreds of pictures, you know, of windshield with, with uh, rain on it, and hundreds of pictures with windshield with no rain on it, and then when it takes a new picture, it basically tries to figure, is there, is there, is this windshield have rain on it or not? And if it has rain, uh, it has rain on it, it will actually activate the wiper. So now if your car is driving, you know, it's facing the sun, somehow the windshield gets confused because it doesn't have in its data set data of a sun hitting a windshield. The software actually thinks it's raining. So the way you fix it is you take a picture and you say, this is not raining. So we have totally shifted of how we develop software. There's no longer code here. Now, many people can actually develop software. Now it doesn't have to be only software developers. Okay. Now, this actually enables you to write much more complex code. So if you can think here in codeware, you know, this is, so here's like the most complex code in the world that you could write. And because of, you know, how smart we are as humans, we're limited by how much we can write, the complexity of the code we write. But when we go now into this AI world, 
we actually define a search space and we give it data and then the computer actually finds the software for us. So now we can develop much more complex software systems with AIware and that's kind of the excitement that a lot of people have. Yeah. So was there, you know, in many ways, this is the kind of the calculator moment. Okay, so, you know, many years ago when people, so a couple of things, a lot of people say, you know, it's the end of software development. Well, the reality is when we develop calculators, we didn't kind of take all the math teachers and kind of, you know, kill them, okay? We still kept them around, okay? Same thing, you know, when we develop Excel, we didn't get rid of all the accountants. Instead, when it comes to developers, when it comes to account, so when it comes to mathematicians, when it comes to accountants, they're now working more interesting problems, right? And now we have much more, you know, millions, Instead of having millions of developers, we have actually billions of software makers. We have actually developers that are more excited about what they're working on. But the key thing here to realize that we're talking about software where there's not, not be a lot of code in there. Instead, it's the foundation model or agents that are actually operating in there. Okay. So you can think of that kind of progression of software from codeware, which is kind of what we're accustomed to, used to, to newer world, which is like neural networks. And then promptware, you know, slash ragware, agentware, and then mindware, okay? The difference is when it comes to promptware and agentware, they're using foundation models in the back end, so like large language models, and mindware is using other technologies, okay? And all of this is AIware. So how you develop that software and the complexities around it, you know, is a whole new area that our field is still kind of trying to grasp around. And especially, as I said, you know, um, across the field, a lot of people might have the same problem, but that problem is nobody actually is even recognizing as speaking of it more, you know, prominently. So it's important to kind of put that down and actually start to get these discussion going across the community. Okay. Now I want to highlight something is it's not either codeware or newerware or promptware or agentware. Instead, actually software is going to be a combination of many things, right? So many foundation models that are kind of customized or, you know, fine-tuned that actually fit into promptware. In addition, there are still code that's going to be written. There's still actually neural networks going to be written. And all of that is going to be combined to create the software of the future. And a lot of you have developed these softwares, you recognize that. It's not like Greenfield, we're dropping everything and we're going to the new planet and everything is going to be foundational models, okay? So that kind of vision actually as well, uh, recently Berkeley has, they've called it, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the book we gave it. Okay, but basically the idea is that it's not one big foundation model. Instead, it's a multitude of foundation models. It's a multitude of components, and you're basically plugging and playing, and the design of the software becomes a very important part. And we're already seeing this, right? So we're already seeing kind of, you, you know, I would say this kind of like essay programming, you know, uh, artistic programming, personal avatar programming. So that would say end user programming, okay? And then we have seen as well enterprise programming, so things like uh, Power Automate from Microsoft or Microsoft Flow, okay? And even there are already kind of in research labs examples of databases or operating systems that are actually, or compilers that don't have a lot of code in them, actually instead it's all foundational models, okay? So now the beauty of this is, you know, we're going from the kind of things you would do as a software maker, okay? versus all the way, you know, as professional developers. And more and more, we're enabling, you know, people that might not be super experts. So they're experts in the domain, but they're not experts in the computing, uh, uh, you know, and programming. Okay. So the first thing is, you know, the same way we have that kind of life cycle, kind of, you know, whether it's waterfall or so on, you know, the question is, what is exactly the life cycle for this FMware? Okay. So this is kind of our first attempt based on our experiences. So, you know, for... So the interesting thing is requirement engineering will always stay, okay? Unfortunately, the reality is we still have to deal with humans. So humans are the weakest link, okay? So today now, requirements is the most important thing. A lot of times even when you actually work with, you know, a chat GPT or something, it might give you the wrong answer. But if you look back, you never told it what you want, okay? So what we're noticing is that requirement engineering is becoming even more important in this case. Now, the beauty here is, you know, and if you know, if you work any big project, if you have a good requirement engineer that can work, a requirement analyst that can work with a customer, that process becomes much smoother going down, right? The beauty now is because of this whole process now going down here, can be automated, 
you know, the feedback loop can be going much faster. The other thing here is we're moving from this idea of, you know, software architectures to what we call cognitive architecture. So deciding how you're going to break down the thinking of your system. Okay. And now interaction design talks more about how you're actually going to involve the users in that type of thinking, where it's going to be fully, you're going to give it all the way to the agents to do that, or you're going to break it down where you're going to bring in the user sometimes, so kind of ask clarification questions, how much kind of overseeing the, uh, the human has in there. And then the model engineering, which is really comes down to, even if you have access to GPT-20, you're not going to use GPT-20. The reality is nobody will make money if you can only, you're only using GPT-5 or 4, right? Okay, and then the prompt design itself, you know, and then actually workflow engineering and so on. Okay, so the paper kind of talks on this, and we kind of talk about a lot of the challenges around there, and we kind of define, you know, a lot of challenges around this. But what we noticed too, as I said, so, this is from Andre Carpassi, so from Tesla. So, you know, it is easy to demo a car self-driving around a block, but making it into a product takes a decade. And that's actually what a lot of people are noticing now in this kind of domain, right? So this is from LinkedIn, you know, what they found is, you know, going from zero to an 80% ready product, it was very quick, it was very smooth. And then every 1% was even more painful than the 1% before. So that really slows down the progress of the project and frustrates as well kind of the management and the expectations of when you can ship. Okay, um, Microsoft, you know, and GitHub, especially the folks that actually developed um, a lot of the co-pilots. So there was a lot of kind of discussions with them. And one of the things they said is traditionally regression testing. So every time you do a change, you run all your tests. Well, if you actually have GPT in the background, every one of these tests is actually costing money. So every check-in might cost like $5 or $3. Okay, so how do you actually rethink how you do regression testing? The other thing as well, one of the things that you know, Red Hat was noticing is that um, already developing software that used neural network was complex and hard, and having people trained in that area was complex and hard and they're expensive. Now, when you add foundation model, large language model, the amount of people that are trained for this, their salaries and all that, it becomes even much more complicated. So moving forward, getting this into products is becoming one of the ch most challenging things for moving forward, right? So some of the challenges that we kind of highlighted, right? So, you know, intrinsic limitations of foundation models themselves. So, you know, they're not able to deal with complex tasks. So a lot of times you might have to decompose the tasks. The hallucinations, they tend to hallucinate. As well, they are not able to control the external outside world unless you add additional capabilities to them. And then engineering uh, pain points, so, you know, the low productivity, so developers, especially if, you know, if you've done any prompting, it is like one of the most painful processes. It's just like you're, it's a black box and you're changing it and you're not getting the results and you're going back and forth and back and forth. And then a new version of GPT comes out, you have to redo all that pain again, okay? There's a lot of high risks and as well a lot of high cost, for example, like I was saying, when it comes to, for example, the um, regression testing. Okay. So, you know, I, we had like 10 challenges. I'm not going to go through all of them all. I'm just going to go through a couple of them to give you a flavor of that. And then, you know, happy to have discussions or questions on that, right? So, we have moved now from this idea of code to data. Remember the, the, this idea of the the wiper, right? And only they take, a person just takes a picture, right? So today we have new data types and data types that are much harder to curate and takes a lot more costly to curate. You know, there's actually a lot of challenges about data leakage. You know, actually the amount of quality of the data plays a big role. So it's not, it's not more is better because the more you have, the longer the whole process is takes, the more expensive things come. And state of practices, so, you know, uh, Snorkel is doing some work on active learning in that area and kind of weak supervision. Okay, um, so innovation paths we're seeing. So, you know, you know, how we can actually do that kind of human and AI kind of working together to do that manual. Supported with, supporting the human was the kind of automated um, labeling and as well this idea of synthetic data generation, okay. The whole notion of what exactly it means to do open source and inner source, not on code, but actually do it with data. There was, there was earlier today, there was a very nice demo by IBM, by folks from IBM on this. So 
how do you actually have hundreds of your customers or your users contributing pieces of data that's been tagged and then bringing all that back in to create the next version of software system. So now we have a much wider user base, a much more the developer base than classical open source. Okay. You know, now comes to uh, crafting effective prompts. You know, uh, the best way I would describe it, in my opinion, prompting is at the same level of writing assembly code. Okay, I think in the next two, two years, ideally we won't be doing prompting, we're gonna be doing something a bit more higher level. Okay, so they're too low level, they're very fragile, as soon as GPT changes between even same versions of GPT, but different like releases of it, you see differences, okay? Prompts don't transfer, so if you wanna transfer from Gemini to GPT, the prompts are not transferring, right? You know, and the problem right now is there is basically no prompt debugging, right? So the old days when your system crashes, you actually can put a debugger, figure out what's happening, and say, oh, you know, I forgot to check for a null pointer here, okay? Uh, today, there's very limited support to debugging to tell you, okay, you know what? The reason the, the, the model is always giving you wrong results is because it's kind of fixated on this colon that you have somewhere in the text of your prompt. Okay, so yeah, so, um, you know, state of practice today is there some type of work that trying to at least give you which parts of the prompts that are kind of triggering the model, okay? Um, and there's work that sort of recently in actually trying to optimize prompts, okay? But it's still kind of very limited. It doesn't actually deal with the hardware environment. It doesn't go across models. Primarily, most of the work is done on GPT uh, 3 and 4, okay? So higher level prompting is kind of needed, this idea of instead of actually prompting, but more talking about intent, right? And being able to reproduce your prompts across different runs. And I want to show you an example of, you know, of how, how finicky sometimes prompting is. So this is, this is not work by me, but it was somebody else, okay? And you can see, so that the best prompt, you know, the accuracy was 0 0.8, okay? And this one was a 0 0.036. And all you can see is that they did is, yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll just point with my fingers. Okay, so you can see, so like they just change this colon and when they remove the colon, you can see the big jump, okay? And then now when they put it all on the same line, you got the highest performance. So, you know, I don't envy people that are doing prompting. It's like, like black magic, okay? And I, I hope we, we don't want the rest of our lives to be like that, okay? So, you know, this has to change, <laughs> okay? The good news is, because a lot of times there's people working in their own team, in their own project, and think, okay, I, I must be not that smart. No, you're not, you, well, maybe you're not. But the reality is, is it's a problem across the whole industry and bubbling it up, discussing these problems, defining challenges, grand challenges that the whole area needs to work on and focus on. It's kind of one of the focuses we were trying to do here, right? The other thing is multi-generated so software. So as I said, it's not only going to print promptware or agentware or codeware. It's going to be a combination of many things. There are pieces of code that you don't want to use a prompt. You know, you don't want to use a foundation model to write. You don't want to use a large language model to write. There are other pieces that actually you want to use it. There's a lot of power that comes with it. Okay? Um, you know, and then the problem is you do a change in any of that software systems, whether you change the foundation model, the foundation model gets upgraded, you change one of your old code bases that was like a, a driver, the impact that bubbles up to the top because they're so sensitive even to spacing can be kind of drastic and at least a lot of retesting, a lot of costs involved in there. Okay, so some of the state of practices, you know, there's some work today, you know, about plugins to kind of ease some of this. You know, some of the works today is doing is they're trying to package a lot of the legacy code into kind of tools that the FMwares or the agents could use. Okay, and I think one of the key points here, at least where kind of some of the people working on is recognizing that building a foundational model a software system it's not greenfield it's because you don't only have the legacy data uh, the legacy code but as well you have the leg legacy data so you need to be able to actually be able to integrate all this legacy so uh, uh, software and data together okay 
and then degree of controllability. So I'm kind of going to fast track for these so we can have time for questions. So um, today, you know, while agents promise a lot of flexibility and the ability to be autonomous, it's hard to build these type of software systems kind of, you know, and depend on the agent's ability to actually detect things and act appropriately. So those are complex things. Okay, so we're going to go very fast. Okay. Compliance and regulations. Okay. A lot of problems in there too. Okay. Uh, you know, I think the key one would be, uh, you know, so we have S bomb and there's SPDX for AI bomb, but the AI bomb is totally incapable to even describe foundation models. And it's not able to describe FM wares. Okay, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The notion of data is totally different in this world. Um, today, it doesn't mean large language models means there's more data. There's actually a lot of different types of data and the license and all these types of data. Even when you put thumbs up and thumbs down, there's a licenses that you're agreeing on with your customers on how you can use that data. So data becoming a very complex thing out of this whole thing, okay? Uh, very limited support and collaborations, you know, um, in particular, how you do versioning. So do you version the prompt? Do you version parts of the prompt? There's a lot of challenges in there. When, today, when you download an agent off the internet, that agent over time evolves by itself. So how do you do versioning of that? How do you do licensing for that? Okay. So semantic observability is another thing. Uh, you know, I think the key thing today is, remember, a lot of times there's no code because the agents are just acting by themselves, okay? So even if you're logging everything, then you find a problem. You try to go back to find the code, but that code doesn't exist. You try to run it again, but the agent acted differently, okay? Even being able to deterministically run this. Uh, when we did this, like this challenge, we hadn't developed a lot of uh, agent wares, but this actually is becoming one of the biggest problems because when something breaks, it's hard to get the agents to go back and repeat stuff. And it's hard to actually, to even ask the agents to explain why they're doing something. Because if we ask them to explain why they're doing something, then they actually change their behaviors. Okay. Uh, performance engineering, you know, I, I guess one key thing to highlight is Today, there's a lot of works you see about uh, very complex, uh, I, I would call them cognitive architecture. So you have, instead of asking GPT, you ask, so you have one agent asking GPT, another agent kind of analyzing the results, and a third agent fixing the results, okay? So this looks very nice, but actually when you put this in production, it doesn't work because the latency becomes very, comp very long, right? Because the user asks a simple question, and now you have three foundational model queries and they're going back to back. So suddenly a user is expecting somebody to come back instantaneous. It's saying quite a bit of time. Okay. Uh, so testing under uh, non-determinism, I think most people kind of are feeling that pain, you know, today as well. Um, so silo tooling and lack of process. So this is kind of what really triggered us to create this whole new platform, which we call the FM Arts. We wanted to basically create something that's kind of the equivalent of you think of GitHub for this new type of software, right? Um, this is kind of what, it, what it, we have created, right? And we're trying to work now to try to open source this. But basically, you have different studios, so studios for alignment, for knowledge studios, agent studios, orchestration studios, prompt studios, and operation studios. And then now you have assets, and now the assets are becoming much more complex, not only a piece of source code, it's a prompt, it's actually parts of the prompt. It's an agent. How you do versioning all of this becomes a problem itself. Now, FMware frameworks. So this would be things like um, Langshin, okay? Now, what we have noticed too today, um, you know, Langshin and so on, they generate basically like Python scripts. But because you generate Python scripts, you cannot do a lot of optimizations at the bottom. And what we notice is because we don't have, well, most of the world, unless you're like, you know, Microsoft, Microsoft and OpenAI, don't have access to a lot of actually machines and GPUs. So you need a runtime that could have like, you know, with free GPU cards, you can serve like 20 developers. 
and how it actually alternates between all of that. Okay? So that's another area that a lot of people are kind of trying to work on. Okay? And that kind of touches on performance engineering and operational management. So, you know, basically, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you, we're kind of we're just starting on this. Um, the key purpose of this is, you know, I'm sure, well, I would love if anybody reads this and says, oh, you missed this challenge or that challenge, right? And then from there, we want to be able to add them to start the discussions. Otherwise, everybody in the industry is working on it separately and siloed, and our processes are very inefficient. So, um, you know, the paper, the, the paper is here. You can get it from that uh, QR code, right? Now, we're working on this actually with multiple angles, okay? So, um, from an academia point of view, we actually created a kind of a, a graduate program that actually tries to teach students how to actually develop foundational model kind of FMware. Okay. In addition, this is actually, this was, this is part of the LFAI. So this is the OPIA kind of, so it's an open platform for enterprise AI. So this a team of companies that are working primarily on trying to standardize this whole thing, right? So they're focusing right now on RAG, so RAGware. And you're trying to standardize all the different components in there and standardize the interfaces. So today, if you have a vector database and you, move, you want to move to a different vector database, it's not like moving between SQL databases. They all have their own interfaces. So if we can at least get everybody to standardize on interfaces, that that whole marketplace becomes much more, you know, much more independent evolution in it. And then at the bottom, so this is kind of the AIware team and now this is teams, like these are primarily academics. Now, there are companies in here, but these are the people, the folks in the research lab of these companies that are trying to figure out, okay, how we can make it such that people can develop FMware apps, efficient ones, and with high productivity. Okay. We actually started a conference that's going to be later in the summer in July in Brazil. Okay really trying to realize what, how do you develop this AI power software? How do you evolve it? What exactly is the definition of that software? And yeah, so that's, that's everything from my side. Happy to take any questions. If... If there's a question, raise your voice, otherwise we're good. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, sorry. There is. Well, I can't see. Sorry. Because <laughs> the lights are in my. So where? where oh, sorry. Here. <laughs> okay. Um, it was more. Could you go back to the degree of controllability? It was slightly too quick. Right. You want to go back to that slide? Okay. Good. I cannot make this sound backwards, okay? Oh. <laughs> okay, we're here. Good. Yes, please go ahead. go ahead. Did you have a question on this or? Can you, um, have you seen any approaches here that you've seen work well to improve this? I know you've got the innovation path, but have you seen any in practice? So yeah, so, so there's this basically the standard operating procedures, right? Um, it's very similar. So here's the thing is, even if you have a super smart person come to your company, you give them some basic operating procedures, right? So for example, you say, you cannot run around naked in the office, even if you're the smartest person around, okay? So you need to actually put some rules on these foundational models and agents, okay? The question right now is how much rules you put, and that's the challenge. If you put too much, then you almost become back to kind of codeware software. So right now, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, uh, Microsoft is kind of probably uh, the, the, the furthest ahead in that part at this moment, yeah. How do you integrate the stochastic system with the switch rules? Thank you. How do you integrate the, the stochastic nature of your, of your newer models with the strict rules? How do you, how do you, there's no, there's no interface between them. How do you do that? So it's the same way you, you in, so if you have, so it's a difference between if you have an intern and you have, you know, a senior developer, okay? 
it's the amount of confidence and trust you have to them, right? So, you, so there's two ways. You say, this, this foundational model is too weak. I don't want to give it a lot of trust. So I'm going to really break down everything, small thing for them. And you have to do, tell me, but then it ends up hitting you in the latency. Okay? Or you go the other way around where you say, just go crazy. I, I trust you. Yeah. I think one of the key things we, we observed is uh, it's actually a totally different definition of software. We think of software as always right. Right? But actually, this is software that grows with you. And it's the same for, like, if you have an intern and the first time he brings you a coffee and he brings it with sugar, you'll be annoyed. Like, you'll be a little bit annoyed. But if he does it again, you'll be really annoyed. Okay? Same thing for software. So that's when you do these thumbs up and thumbs down. The software is actually growing and learning with you. So it changes how we think of software and then the impact on quality assurance and actually how to engineer that software becomes much more complex. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so I did join in between, so I'm not sure if you have already uh, told us about this. But like in the end, when you said like, uh, so platforms are trying to make a glue uh, sort of situation where like we can actually transfer data from each other. So isn't that like ETL and all these pipelines are doing the same stuff or like you're talking about something else? Like 5TAN and all these stuff? So this was the asset management. This is, this is more like, like source code. So how you manage your source code, how you manage your databases, how you manage your prompts. Like that was the... <laughs> We're almost there. <laughs> Next time I only have four, prom four challenges. Okay, here. <laughs> so so this, is not, not, this is not the, the ETL. This is actually like... We have changed from where software is defined by only source code, but actually is defined by data. And there are different types of data too. So there's the data that you got from the internet, the data that you paid people to actually tag, and the data that your customer actually gives you input at runtime. So now all these types of data need to be versioned and managed. And as well, the agents themselves need to be managed. You download an, an online agent that's open source. Three months it's running inside your company. Now it has a lot of data that's coming from your company. What's the license of that software? Or that agent. Make sense? This is like the training data and like logs that we are getting. Sorry, sorry. Like, uh, is like the asset management we are yeah. talking about over here is regarding the training data. It, it's the training data in it too. It's but it's the assets for developing software. Okay. Okay. So like, like when we think of software, we think of like you know GitHub and checking yeah. a, a source code file. Well, you check in, a, you check in actually a piece of a tag, you know, like a thumbs up by a user or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your patience. I'm the last guy, so now you can go and enjoy yourself. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>